Ivan Guerrero is a filmmaker from the Philippines and, like many of us, grew up watching Sesame Street. Stating in the manual for this set that the show was one of his first teachers, and with many who watched it, the setting and characters and lessons of Sesame Street stuck with him even into his adulthood. And that was what inspired him to put together this Lego idea set. There's a lot to look at here, so this is going to be a two-parter, looking at the actual build today and the minifigures in part two. Hi everyone, I'm Mac, and this is Lego Idea Set 21324, the 34th set in the Ideas line. This is 123 Sesame Street. In 1969, Sesame Street workshops started with a single bold question, could television be used to educate kids? With a barrier-breaking cast, deep early childhood education expertise, and the unforgettable Muppets of Sesame Street, the founders set out to do just that, and Sesame Street has been asking the big questions and reaching inspiring milestones ever since. With guiding principles closely linked to the LEGO Group's own agenda of learning and play, they have given us the newest LEGO Ideas model, a tribute to a groundbreaking TV series. There's not a time in my childhood that I don't remember Sesame Street being on TV. I learned so much from the show, the alphabet, counting, rudimentary Spanish, special needs, empathy, and I even learned about death. I cannot underestimate the influence Sesame Street had on me as a child and how much it is a part of who I am. To this day, I still listen to the 1975 Sesame Street Christmas record every Christmas season, which means I'll be breaking it out in about a week or so. Bob, Louise, Maria, Gordon, Linda, Grover, Bert and Ernie, Harry Monster, The Count, Mr. Snuffleupagus, Big Bird, and of course Mr. Hooper are all as endeared to me as my own family. So when I saw that Lego was producing 123 Sesame Street, I'm not going to lie, my heart swelled a little. Just what a lot of us needed this year. This is the first time that Sesame Street and Lego have come together, and I am honestly amazed it took them this long. What's even more surprising is that when they finally did merge, it took an idea set to make it happen instead of a standard line. I was so in love with this set before I even saw it that I bought it online at midnight the day it went on sale. Is it worth all my self-imposed hype? Let's find out together. Sunny day, sleeping up. First, let's talk about the look of the finished model. The color, the style, the design, everything here is easily and immediately recognizable as Sesame Street. From the brownstone apartment building to Mr. Hooper's store positioned diagonally from the main building, all of the space is used here. Nothing is wasted, but it's not crowded. There's plenty to do here, plenty of play space, and plenty of ways to place and display your minifigures all around it. There's a lot to look at here, a lot of Easter eggs, so let's start from the side and work our way around front. Starting at the right, we first have Big Bird's Nest, and with this we need to talk about something. This is not an exact replica of the Sesame Street set that we are all so familiar with, but the charm, theme, and aesthetic of Sesame Street are all here, and we begin that right here. Now, some people might be missing the sight of Big Bird being surrounded by the multicolored doors that was traditionally associated with his nest, but in 2016, in Season 46, Big Bird's nest received a makeover that got rid of the construction doors and placed his nest in a tree with cabinets nailed to the branches. And that is the version of the nest that we have here. A brown tub element is used for the nest itself and sits on a small build with some plant elements representing his tree. I especially like the large brown branch element with the cabinet build. The small piece on top of the cabinet I believe is supposed to be Big Bird's dump truck in which case it should have been green and not blue. Other little accessories for Big Bird is his teddy bear radar that sits in his nest, along with a set of roller skates that can either decorate his area or go on his feet for skating down the street. Two pictures adorn Big Bird's nest, a photograph of his best friend, Mr. Snuffleupagus, and one that hits close to home for me, an element that displays a rendition of the hand-drawn picture of our dear Mr. Hooper. It's even signed by Big Bird himself. The backdrop for Mr. Hooper's portrait is a wall of multicolored bricks that I feel is a nod to the multicolored construction door origins of Big Bird's Nest. Coming around the corner, we are greeted by the sight of the iconic brownstone apartment building 123 Sesame Street itself. The look is slightly different from its TV representation, missing a third window on the second floor, but everything else is here. Everything that is needed to immediately identify what you're looking at. 
The stairs leading up to the large twin doors when the address printed across the transparent bricks is a welcoming and familiar sight, and the use of pearlescent elements for the lights to either side of the door was an inspired touch to continue to add to the uniqueness of this set. Even the windows have been fashioned in such a way that they nearly perfectly resemble their TV counterpart. With some people already pointing out that the green is much brighter than the coloring of the show, personally, I don't have a problem with this as you want LEGO sets to be colorful and to pop. Down front in the low wall section of the brownstone we have Oscar in his new, as of season 46, location with the dumpster and recycling bin. Oscar's trash can, as you can see, is positioned just below the window to Elmo's bedroom. Instead of the standard trash can lid, LEGO decided to go with a round 2x2 plate and I think I know why, but we'll take a look at that in part 2 when we look at the minifigures. Also included is a heart-shaped element that is printed with the likeness of Slimy, Oscar's pet worm. On the second floor, coming back around to the right side above Big Bird's nest is Ernie's window box, complete with the milk carton for the Tweedlebug family to live in. Now coming around to the left side of the apartment building, oh man did they pack a lot of stuff in over here. First they included a fire escape that, while it is in the most impractical place ever, really adds something to the style of this building. It has plenty of space to place minifigures and even has a descending ladder. And below the fire escape we have Abby Cadabby's Fairy Garden. A much smaller representation than the on-screen setting, it is still nice that they were able to include this in some way with a great mural painting of Abby painted on the side of the building, and if you look at the garden, you can also see her fairy wand. Back up to the second floor, we have a great billboard advertising Biff and Sully's construction company. I personally loved these guys when I was watching the show as a kid, and I am glad they were able to be part of this set somehow. And now around the corner, diagonally from 123 Sesame Street, is another building that is arguably just as iconic and important as the brownstone itself, Mr. Hooper's store. The character of Mr. Hooper was one of the first four human characters of the show and was a special friend to Big Bird. When the actor, Will Lee, passed away in 1982, instead of simply writing the character out or recasting him, the Children's Television Workshop did something unheard of. They discussed the reality of death head-on on a children's show. It was heartbreaking and wonderful all at the same time, and I still remember watching that episode when it aired. Mr. Hooper's legacy has lived on through the show by keeping his variety store a central point of the show and Big Bird's ever-present picture of him hanging by his nest. At the front of the store, we see the classic green and white awning, something that I believe only went away for one season. Underneath the front window is what I believe to be another trash bin with some food elements placed in it as well as two newspapers, one up front talking about the horrors of a porridge shortage, a plot point from a past episode. The other paper is headlined with Super Grover Saves the Day Again. This is a fantastic nod to Grover's alter ego, but also adds a bit of a sting that Grover isn't one of the included minifigures with this set. On the second floor, we have light brown and tan bricks that give us a nice contrast to the storefront, as well as the new neon sign for Hoopers. And a small detail, but it's worth noting, I love the aesthetic of this window. Around the side of Hooper's store, just down from Abby's Fairy Garden, is the outdoor cafe extension of the store. A cafe table with a red and white checkered sticker representing the tablecloth is positioned just outside the service window. Below is a plate piece with a sticker bearing a classic yellow and black pattern of Hooper's, and on the counter sits a five cent piece as well as a coffee cup element that looks great. We also have a clever little build for the cash register here. I don't often use the word cozy, but there's really no other way to describe this little tucked away nook of Sesame Street. Coming back around to the front of the set and the left side of Hooper's store, we have our opening. And I'll admit, it's a little odd that the access to the interior of the store is from the side and the front of the set itself, but looking inside, we can see why. With the wall of knickknacks for sale inside the store, there would have been no other way to position this inside without blocking the door. The interior of Hooper's store isn't overly decorated, but it looks good for what it is. All of the product on the shelf is made of printed pieces. Peeking around the back, we have the only section of the entire set that I find disappointing. The back of Hooper's store is ugly. There's no other way to say it. 
In fact, it looks like this part of the set is incomplete. With the hodgepodge of colors on the back and the open hole pieces down the side, it looks like there should have been some plate pieces here covering things up. On the second floor, we have one of my favorite little tucked away spaces of the set, Cookie Monster's Apartment. And how do you know it's Cookie Monster's Apartment? There's a cookie on the floor. There are a lot of little Easter eggs in this confined space, from the picture of Cookie Monster's foodie truck hanging over the wall over his yellow armchair and ottoman. The chair itself resembles the chair he sits in when he takes on the aristocratic role of Alistair Cookie. Guy Smiley is on the television and it looks like Cookie is ready to record his favorite show because there's a VHS tape loaded in the front of the VCR. And above the TV is a portrait of one of my favorite members of the gang, Count Von Count. If I thought it was disappointing that Grover wasn't part of this set, then it's a crime the Count wasn't included here. Who knows, he might be the reason why I'm a bit of a vampire fanboy. But at least the Count was represented here from this great portrait. Further representing the Count, right above him on the roof is a bat, and anyone who has seen the show knows that Count Von Count is always surrounded by his bats in his castle home. He's even named some of them. Also on the roof is a great looking build of a roof AC unit. And now that we're looking inside buildings, it's time to look around to the back of the brownstone and see what's inside there. Before we get a detailed look, there's something we have to accept. To put walls in place to separate the different rooms of each floor, the build of the brownstone would be much larger and bulkier than it already is. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at what we have. On the first floor, we have our entry here, and I feel like this red section to the left is supposed to be the lobby of the building and not actually part of Elmo's apartment. Not only do we have the red carpet here, but we have a bulletin board posted with various drawings by Elmo featuring Telly Monster as well as the Martians. Next to it, we have an old-time wall-mounted telephone and even a fire alarm tucked up in the corner, complete with an alarm box on the outside. Moving to the right, we get Elmo's place. Light yellow plate pieces denote his area and we can see that he has toys spread all over his home. A rocket ship, a stuffed bunny, his toy train, a ball on the nightstand, and his goldfish bowl on the chest of drawers. His bed is small, but that's okay. Elmo's a small monster. Adorning the walls of his home are the pictures of a bridge, a photo of him and his father, and a photo of Elmo's friends, Zoe and Rosita. Moving up to the second floor, we come to the one of the most iconic interior settings of Sesame Street, Bert and Ernie's apartment. We have visited their home many times over the years, and it's impressive how much Lego has managed to fit into this relatively small space. First, we have their bedroom, with their twin beds separated by their nightstand. In this small space, there are plenty of details like Bert's bottle cap and paperclip collections. The photo of the two friends together hangs on the wall, and a shelf above each bed holds up some of their toys. Moving right, we have Bert's armchair that he is always sitting in when he's trying to enjoy a good book. And speaking of a good book, we also have this small build accessory, Cooking with Oatmeal. No doubt one of Bert's collection, maybe off the bookshelf behind his chair. Opening the book, we see there's even writing inside. And finally, that brings us to the last part of the friend's place, the bathroom. More specifically, the bathtub, the place where Ernie likes to soak and relax and play with his rubber ducky. An accessory element that, of course, we get perched here on the edge of the tub. I love the look of Bert and Ernie's apartment. It's my favorite interior of this set, and I appreciate the effort LEGO made to get as much familiarity as they could packed in here. The only thing I might do different is pull Bert's armchair forward so that Ernie can get behind it, as he often does in the show when he's playing with Bert while he's trying to read. And finally, that brings us to the roof of 123 Sesame Street, and the details just keep coming. First, we see that the roof has been cut away on angles towards the middle, making it easier to access the interior of Bert and Ernie's apartment, while still giving us enough space for figure display. Here on the right, directly above the bathtub, is a TV antenna. Never mind, there's no TV in the building. And behind that, of course, we have Bert's pigeon coop and his beloved pigeons. This is a detail that could have been so easily overlooked, but in a set that includes Abby Cadabby's Fairy Garden, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that the designers thought to include it here. On the left, to the opposite side, we have a simple set of exhaust stacks to vent the furnace of the building, complete with a little steam billow coming out of the pipes. Between this and the air conditioning unit on top of Hooper's store, I love that the designers included these roof units, giving the buildings a proper city feel and aesthetic. And finally, 
A loose build that even as I was putting it together, I couldn't believe it was part of the set. This small, simple, loose build is a rendition of the original Martian spaceship. This is fantastic. A simple piece made of two discs held together with a green rod and topped with a transparent dome. I haven't watched Sesame Street in a number of years, so I don't know if the Martian spaceship has changed much since it first appeared, I believe in the 80s, but I love this throwback item that was included with this set. And last, but certainly not least, we have the iconic street sign that greets everyone who visits 123 Sesame Street. Using printed plate pieces, LEGO has managed a very passable rendition of the world's most famous street sign, and I love the use of the pearlescent dome piece as the street light that tops the pole. This is the first time, by the way, that we received this street pole in green. And there you have it, friends, part one of our look at the LEGO Ideas set 123 Sesame Street, and I have to say that as I was putting it together, I knew this was going to be an immediate favorite of mine. This is definitely going to be an ever-present set in my LEGO Town builds, be it my Christmas Village, a Halloween setting, or anything else I might build up, 123 Sesame Street will always have a place in my dioramas. There are so many details and Easter eggs built into this set that it's very possible I didn't catch them all. This is definitely one that is worth seeing for yourself. The majority of the graphics of this set are stickers, including the big pieces like Abby Cadabby's mural. Regular viewers of the channel know that I am not a fan of stickers. I don't have a very steady hand when applying them, but I can tell you this, I have never been more careful applying stickers to anything in my life than when I was building this set. Ollie Gregory and Crystal Marie Fontan, the LEGO designers who bought Ivan Guerrero's idea to life, both profess to be fans of Jim Henson and Sesame Street growing up, and I think it shows in what they've done here. That's all we have for you today, friends. Stay tuned for part two of this review where we take a look at the minifigs that came with this set, and we talk about the importance of them for LEGO. Until then, play well, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and as always, thank you for watching.